Okay, so we'll talk about today. First, W.B. Du Bois, since we didn't get to that last time. But also America in the 1910s, 1920s. So we'll talk some about World War I, which was at the time not known as World War I, but was generally referred to as the Great War. We'll also talk about the Great Migration, one in particular, though we looked at numerous migrations during the latter part of the 19th century last time. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the Harlem Renaissance. We'll talk about those gentlemen there, bottom left, the Harlem Hellfighters, and we'll talk about the man who painted that at bottom right, Aaron Douglas. But first, Du Bois. And I know, look, if you know anything about French, you look at that and you think, well, shouldn't it be Du Bois? Well, he didn't pronounce it that way. And generally, when somebody doesn't pronounce their own name that way, uh, we don't need it. So it's Du Bois. William Edward Burkhart Du Bois. Whose ideas diverged significantly from those of Booker T. Washington, although I think we've made a little bit too much out of wanting to see Du Bois and Booker T. Washington as uh, two sides of a coin or diametrically ideologically opposed. It's not that these guys didn't see anything eye to eye. They both wanted for black Americans to advance to their rightful station in American society. They just had a little bit different views about how that probably best would happen. Um, that being said, I mean, Du Bois was the leading sort of vocal critic of the Washington, what he would call accommodationist approach, favoring instead what we would come to characterize as sort of civil rights agitation. He too called, of course, for economic self-sufficiency and for hard work, but he argued that through not vocational education, but a more traditional liberal arts type education like one would get at Fisk or Howard, as opposed to Hampton or Tuskegee, that that would prepare a sort of talented tenth, a sort of 10% you know, of, of elite educated African Americans that would rise to the top and become the black leaders of America's future. And that this group could then challenge white supremacy, including segregation, directly. And remember, Washington's approach sort of sets aside Jim Crow as it is what it is, and we'll accept it and work within it. Du Bois takes a more directly confrontational approach to that. Now, unlike Washington, Du Bois was born, one, after the war, and two, free in the North whereas Washington had been born enslaved. He was also relatively light-skinned, which certain people gave him a hard time about. He was born in Massachusetts. He comes down south, though, to Fisk, which is where he gets his undergraduate degree in Nashville. And he goes on to get his PhD in history from Harvard, becoming the first black individual to gain a PhD from that institution, America's oldest and most venerable institution of higher education, Harvard. And then he comes back to the South to teach at Atlanta University, now part of the Atlanta University Center. There's four, uh, Spelman and Morehouse and Clark on there. Now, as segregation and disenfranchisement become more entrenched, that is when Du Bois and Washington diverge, with Du Bois calling for uh, liberal arts education, study of the advanced sciences, advocated what some would call an elitist sort of top-down model for change, this notion of a talented tenant, becomes a direct and vocal critic of segregation and of disenfranchisement. Uh, sort of slams Washington in his master work, his magnum opus publication, The Souls of Black Folks, arguing that Washington was like a dictator and used his Tuskegee machine to punish his critics, and that his plan meant that black people had to abandon political power and any hopes of civil rights and true higher education, 
beyond the Washingtonian sort of vocational approach, and that it shifted the burden for black uplift to black people alone, whereas he would argue that it was the nation's problem. He says the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. It's one of his more famous quotations. Du Bois meant that, by the way, for the world, not just for the United States. He's an advocate, an early advocate of pan-Africanism, the identification of the African diaspora and Africans as a shared community wherever they are be it in Africa, in the Caribbean, or in America. And the idea that all of those people ought to work together for the betterment of one another. In 1905, he founded the Niagara Movement, a group of black intellectuals and civil rights advocates, all of whom are sort of critical of or in some way opposed to Washington, and called for an end to segregation, called for voting rights for black people, and called for equal educational opportunity. The following year, he witnessed firsthand in Atlanta, the Atlanta quote-unquote race riot that we talked about, that was one of the emphases for black businesses commingling in Sweet Auburn as opposed to downtown. And then when a similar quote-unquote riot, that is white violence to black people and black people defending themselves, two years later occurred in Springfield, Illinois. This demonstrates the national character of this problem. Makes it vividly clear that it's not just a southern phenomenon. These events also lead prominent black and white intellectuals and reformers to meet in 1909 to form an organization committed to ending racial discrimination and inequality that initially was called the National Negro Committee but was soon renamed the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Du Bois was a founding member, as was Ida Wells, who we've talked about. Well, she and Du Bois would have a falling out. She would leave the organization, but she was among the first, as was Jane Addams, a white woman who you may have heard of, who is one of those uh, primarily responsible for the so-called settlement house movement, the idea that uh, social reformers could establish sort of help centers for immigrants to the United States. They would help them get settled and get an apartment home and get a job and provide child care for their children while they were at work and so on. She was an early member, so it's a biracial organization from its inception, which opens its headquarters in New York City, that's where its headquarters are still today, but has branch offices in cities all across the country very soon. Now, Du Bois works specifically as the director of publicity and research and also as the editor of the NLACP's regular publication, The Crisis in which he published statistics on lynching, uh, wide-ranging news coverage, various opinion pieces. And we'll talk more about the NAACP and what they're attempting to do in the early 20th century, but I can go ahead and tell you that, that victories are hard to come by, and, and the primary modus operandi, the way they operate, not exclusively, but their, their sort of main thing is litigation, that is fighting in court through the law, fighting the system through the system. And that was very hard to do in the 1910s and 1920s. Uh, nonetheless, they eventually will have some success. By the time of World War II, after World War II, you start to see their success in court accelerate significantly. And that is no accident, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, they did have some success in getting a, some cities in the North to ban the film uh, Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation is an early film that uh, I think students of film would say has value just sort of in terms of filmmaking, but in terms of its content, it is a grossly racist glorification of the Ku Klux Klan. It more or less presents the Klan, like I was telling you, in the Lost Cause as the sort of defenders of law and order. 
Uh, they also did get um, the Supreme Court to strike uh, grandfather clauses, which was a minor victory, but a victory nonetheless, an important case in 1915. But in any case, as the idea that we'll talk about here in just a minute of the new Negro begins to blossom, uh, this is an idea that's certainly more in touch with Du Bois's ethos than Washington's, and certainly the NAACP would move towards that. Now, we discussed various migrations, that of um, black folks out of the rural south into southern cities, out of the south period into the west, and of course to the northeast and the midwest, but the biggest of all migrations occurs between about 1915, when the Great War breaks out, and 1940 or so on the eve of the second world war so the interwar period is one of the greatest migrations for african americans and it begins with the opportunity of jobs in the industrial cities of the midwest and the northeast america doesn't get directly involved in world war one at the very beginning but they do work to supply britain and france over in europe with war materials which means American industry would be churning out those goods, which means there are factory jobs to be had. In places like Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland and Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, New York, Boston, cities of the Midwest and Northeast, this is where African Americans moved to during this great migration. 1.5 million black people left the South during this period for those cities. Before this, in 1915, 90% of black Americans lived in the South, imagine that. By the 1940s, it's down to 75 or so percent, and it's even lower by the 1960s. Now, it's not hard to see why black people would want to leave the Jim Crow South, but they're is, uh, in addition to that, consider the, you know, the opportunities afforded by, like I said, wartime industrial jobs, but also on the flip side, consider it's not like when they got to Chicago or Philadelphia or New York, they discovered some racial utopia of equality. They discovered that maybe it was not quite so bad as the Jim Crow South, but that racism, uh, systemic inequality, these were American problems and not just Southern ones. Now, having said all that, most black people did remain in the South, about six million, as opposed to migrating out. I mean, the South was home, after all, flawed or not. And of course, business, both black and white owned, such as it was, uh, fought to try to keep folks in the South. Those are workers, after all. At the same time, industries in the North and Midwest were recruiting black folks to move up there. It's a bit of a, a struggle. But let's look at the, the cities of the North and Midwest and what life might be like. And take, for example, Chicago, the great hub city of the Midwest, where the black daily newspaper, the Chicago Defender, was strongly encouraging migration to that city. And the Defender had thousands of readers, even outside the city in that region. It's one of the top black daily newspapers in America at that time. Upon arrival here, many black immigrants did have the help of the local chapter of an organization we talked about before, the National Association of Colored Women, which modeled itself on Jane Addams' Hull House, which I think I said was a settlement house for her. European immigrants. This is a sort of black American version of that, or at least the National Association of Colored Women filled that void. Black churches also helped in this way, providing child care, food pantries, boys and girls clubs, help finding a home, help finding a job. That being said, it's interesting when Southern black folks arrive and they begin attending these black churches in places like Chicago, the practice of the faith is a little bit different. You know, Southern blacks were used to impassioned 
sermons from preachers, to call and response between the preacher and the congregation, to very energetic hymns and an interactive service. And my church in the north at that time were not necessarily like that. That was kind of out of place for them. But enough southern black folks move up there to sort of give their imprint to the black version of the faith up there. And over time, you get a melding of the two. An example of the, that sort of cultural religious melding would be uh, the emergence of gospel music. Which you could look at the life and career of Mahalia Jackson and see this play out in real time. Arguably the greatest gospel singer in American history, and one of the greatest singers, period, I would argue. He was born in 1911 and grows up very poor in a large family in New Orleans. No accident there that she's from New Orleans and becomes a great musical figure. Listening to early blues singers like Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey, adopting their way of bending and coloring notes. Remember I told you jazz and blues don't necessarily strictly follow all the rules of Western music. She began singing in the Baptist church down there, and at 20, in 1931, she moved to Chicago. Began singing in the local Baptist church there. Offered a spot in the choir. Meets a man, you don't even know his name, but a man named Thomas Dorsey, or not Thomas Dorsey, Thomas Dewey, I'm sorry. I always want to do that. I don't know why. Thomas Dewey is often considered the father of black gospel. He writes the song, Take My Hand, Precious Lord, which becomes uh, a hit recorded for Mahalia Jackson. He is born a blues pianist from uh, Villa Rica, Georgia, right down the road. And becomes very adept at taking Christian hymns and sort of giving them a blues and jazz flavor. You know what's even worse than, than getting somebody's name wrong and then correcting yourself? Can you guess? Realizing that you had it right the first time and you shouldn't have corrected yourself to begin with. Thomas Dewey uh, runs <laughs> It's a white guy who ran against Harry Truman for president. Thomas Dorsey is the individual that I'm attempting to discuss vis-a-vis -vis Mahalia Jackson. I'm not going to ask you about that. It doesn't matter. But it's on a recording, and I don't look like a dumbass, so it is important to correct myself one way or the other. <sighs> Man. Anyway, so... Um, Dorsey's wife died in childbirth, and his son died two weeks later, he has a, what we might call a nervous breakdown. This is what leads him to, to write Take My Hand, Precious Lord. It's a beautiful song, of course, which you may have heard. Uh, but again, it becomes a, a great hit that propels Mahalia Jackson's career in the late 1930s and into the 40s. And the two of them uh, tour together and record together to great acclaim. By the 1950s, she was playing at Carnegie Hall, touring Europe, being hailed as you know the greatest living gospel singer uh, in later life, she would meet Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy. She would sing at multiple uh, campaigns or events of SCLC, an organization we'll talk about during the classical phase of the Civil Rights Movement. She has a role in the Montgomery Bus Boycott, the March on Washington. In fact, you guys know the, the famous speech that King gives at the March on Washington? I have a dream, right? It was a speech he had given before. I mean, you know, a guy like King had a briefcase and a filing cabinet at home and, and you know, handwritten notes. He, he had speeches to pull out and give. Uh, and this is not, was not the first time he had given that one. In fact, he was sort of, he was on a different track giving a different sort of speech there in Washington that day. And supposedly, uh, Mahalia Jackson is there. She's one of the performers. And she's standing behind him and she says, tell him about the dream, Mark. And this is what has him sort of impromptu pivot towards that speech, and you know the rest is, is history, I suppose. She also mentored, by the way, the great Aretha Franklin, who would take up the mantle of um, the sort of 
greatest African-American woman singer of her generation, even though she was more inclined to sing you know, what they would call secular music, that is not strictly gospel Christian music. Uh, but she, of course, becomes um, a, a sort of legendary in her own time. Well, as I alluded to earlier, we know that black immigrants to northern and midwestern cities realize that, of course, discrimination, inequality, segregation, these are not just southern phenomena. Uh, segregation, though, outside of the south tended to be what has been called in the past uh, de facto segregation. De facto as opposed to de jure. Um, De jure, the root, the root there of jure is like in jury, jurist, jurisprudence, meaning by law. So segregation in the South, particularly with things like schools, public accommodations, that is in the law. It says separate for black and white in the law, right? Supreme Court had opened up the way to do that. Outside of the South, it's not necessarily written in law, it just is. It is a fact, de facto, is what that means. And so if you look at a city like Chicago, since we've been focused on it, you can see that the vast majority of black people in Chicago lived on the South Side. That's sort of downtown, what they call the loop right there. Below that on the South Side, overwhelmingly African there. There's no law that stipulates that. But historians lately have said we really shouldn't call it de facto because there's all kinds of laws that make that possible. Federal government provides uh, loans to uh, white people more readily than black people. Uh, the federal government draws maps of cities in the 1930s that identify black neighborhoods and encourage lenders not to lend to people, uh, not to lend to black people to live in white neighborhoods. Realtors enforce that policy, homeowners associations, banks, and so on. State and local governments play a role. So it's not that it just organically is. It is because the white power structure has made it so. And we can recognize that there is a distinction between it being stipulated blatantly in the law like it is in the South and how it was in places like Chicago or New York. But calling it de facto shouldn't mean that we just assume, well, it just kind of was because people wanted to, you know, live among their people or whatever. It's not the case. By the 1920s, the black population of the South Side of Chicago, by the way, had tripled which strained an already inadequate housing market, public uh, work systems, sewage systems, lighting, uh, police protection. And when black people tried to move into nearby white neighborhoods, though, there was both the kind of resistance that I was just mentioning from homeowners associations, realtors, bankers, etc., but also violence. We tend to think about racially motivated bombings in places like my hometown of Birmingham, Alabama. But consider that between 1917 and 1921, just a four year period, there were more than 50 racially motivated bombings in the city of Chicago. Typically when a black family would move into a white neighborhood and they would get their home bombed. Of course, in Chicago and elsewhere, black communities develop like group economies we talked about, like Sweet Auburn and Atlanta, black business districts. The big difference with a city like Chicago versus say Birmingham or to a somewhat lesser extent Atlanta is that black people in Chicago and other places in the North and Midwest could at least vote some of them. You didn't have the widespread disenfranchisement that you had in the South. And so it was that Chicago, they were able to elect some black representatives, notably Oscar DeFries, who first served in the 1910s as a city alderman, like a city councilman. 
and then in 1928 becomes the first black person elected to the United States Congress to the House of Representatives since Reconstruction. Now, there's one important thing to note when we consider when Dupree's political career began in 1915 and when he's elected to Congress in 1928. Has something happened on the national level, uh, not necessarily racially, uh, uh, I don't want to say noteworthy because it is, but um, has something happened in terms of American constitutional law that maybe would help Oscar Dupree get elected in 1928? Is if we increase the size of the electorate by a significant number at that point? You know, with the 19th Amendment, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment. Women's right to vote, guaranteed by the 19th Amendment, ratified in 1920. And so in areas where black men could already vote to a certain extent, this would mean that black women could then vote too, and so when DePriest is elected, he owes that victory in part to African American women in, in the city of Chicago. Rewind of, step back to 1915 or so when DePriest was first elected to city government. He had the outbreak of the so called Great War. A war that initially the United States is not directly involved in. It would take a couple of years for that to happen. But the United States is an ally of Britain and France, and it supplies those nations with war materials early on. It identifies with those nations as more or less um, liberal democracies, as opposed to their enemies in the war, Austria-Hungary and Germany, which were uh, autocratic empires that had emperors. And so a lot of Americans argued, well, this is a war for democracy, even though we could certainly poke holes in that theory and see it more as a war of, of empire. The United States gets involved in sort of opportunistically. But nonetheless, a lot of black people in America supported the war effort. Thousands of black young men enlisted in the armed forces. Black people bought war bonds from the government as they were encouraging people to do. W.E.B. Du Bois comes out in support of the war, saying, we'll put aside our fight for freedom and equality here at home and fight for democracy abroad. Other black leaders come out against the war, most notably A. Philip Randolph, who would become a key leader uh, in the civil rights struggle moving forward. We'll talk about him more later. He is a socialist, politically speaking. He also may become a labor union leader. He is the editor of a publication known as The Messenger, which he uses to argue against American involvement in the war. He said, why should we quote unquote fight for democracy when black people face second class citizenship in their own country? Nonetheless, 2.3 million black men registered for the draft, that is selective service. 380,000 black men served during the war. Now, most of them were put, the, the leadership of the United States Armed Forces puts most of those black individuals in support units doing menial jobs as we had discussed in the Civil War. But about 42,000 black troops actually participated in combat in Europe once the United States sends troops over. Units were, of course, segregated. But under pressure from the NAACP, from publications like uh, the Chicago Defender that we talked about, similar to what we saw with you know, the push from Frederick Douglass and others during the Civil War, uh, black troops are eventually organized into combat units. And about a thousand black uh, troops are commissioned as officers as opposed to just enlisted men. And off they go to Europe. Um, that being said, 
the general, the American general in charge of the American war effort, General John Pershing, refuses to send those black combat units actually into combat, just holding them back. Now, this is a guy that at the same time is also arguing, we're not going to go over to Europe and have our boys, our troops, fight under the command of British or French generals. We're going to fight independently. You know, America doesn't, you know, play second fiddle to anybody on the field of battle, supposedly. But, <laughs> one of these black combat units, there's a real push to have them actually fight, but he wouldn't let them fight under his command. He essentially gives them to the French. The 369th Infantry Regiment, the 15th New York National Guard, is more or less loaned to the French army to use at their discretion or disposal. And under French command, the 369th is actually put into combat repeatedly in fights with such incredible valor and distinction and success that the entire unit is awarded the highest honor that the French military can bestow, the Croix de Guerre cross of war. The whole unit. It's like the Medal of Honor in America. The whole unit was awarded the Claude de Guerre. And while they're over there and they get to act as sort of ambassadors for black American culture when they're not at the front and they're hanging out in Paris or wherever they're playing ragtime and jazz and blues and interacting with French citizens in a way that uh, you know, would have been perhaps less common in the United States, to which, of course, they must return. The United States didn't give them a thing. Uh, they were not recognized at all by the United States Army or government until they were mostly posthumously, that is, after they all have died, they were, some of them awarded the Legion of Merit and America's Medal of Honor in the 1990s. They didn't even get a victory parade, had to hold their own in Harlem when they got back. with performers like Bojangles Robinson, we talked about in the last lecture, having a part in that. And let's talk about the America that they returned to, by the way. Where the violence there is being done to them. Beginning with events in East St. Louis in 1917 throughout Though the 1890s and 19 aughts and 1910s, even before 1917, there had been these so-called race riots that we've talked about, which were not race riots at all, but were the outbreaks of white violence under black people in which occasionally black people could fight back. We talked about that in Atlanta. And then uh, in 1910, it happened all over the United States. Uh, there was a legendary black boxer by the name of Jack Johnson who becomes a heavyweight champion of the world. And then they, they, this white guy who hadn't been champion himself before says he's going he's gonna to take down Johnson and, and, and win one for the white race. He was a great white hope. He was going to defeat Jack Johnson in this fight they had, which supposedly the, the fight of the century. And, uh, of course, he lost, and you know, Johnson beat him. And white people just couldn't stand it. Particularly because Jack Johnson, you know, obviously he's the heavyweight champion of the world, was very wealthy and lived a sort of uh, outwardly lavish lifestyle and had a, a number of white girlfriends and black or white men just couldn't stand it. And so they lashed out in their own communities, attacking black businesses, black family homes and whatnot. Atlanta witnesses the outbreaks of violence there in 1910. And so there is precedent for this when, as America is getting involved in the Great War, violence is occurring in the streets of America in 1917. In East St. Louis, there was a strike at a local aluminum company. And a lot of the workers were, were white, but the company hired you know, four or 500 or so black workers to replace them. When you have a strike, like that, a labor movement and workers collectively 
refusing to work to, you know, to get the company to listen to their demands. And all the company does is fire those people and hire new people. They call the new people scabs. And, and the labor unions hate those people because that undermines your ability to get what you want done by way of a strike. If they can just replace you with other workers. And in this case, the scabs were black and that causes white people to lash out all throughout the community. I mean, engaging in just drive-by shootings, for example. Uh, and black people, though, retaliated, defend themselves, and in this case, accidentally killed two plainclothes policemen, which caused more reprisal violence. And in the end, 125 black men, women, and children have been tortured and murdered, and entire swaths of black neighborhoods in East St. Louis destroyed. Similar events unfolded across the country, culminating in violence so bad in the summer of 1919, the, the last year of the Great War, that it was dubbed the Red Summer by James Wilton Johnson, who was then a field secretary for the NAACP. We'll talk about him in a minute. Those murders included a number of servicemen, people who, black men who had fought for America over in Europe and have to come back and face lethal violence at home. And uh, we, we, we won't have the chance to talk about the nature of the Great War in here, but the combat in that war was horrifying. And the idea that you could somehow survive that and then come home and get killed is just mind-boggling. Perhaps the worst violence of all occurred in Chicago when during that red summer there were five days of fighting, 23 black people killed, 15 white people, 500 black people seriously injured, a thousand plus black homes destroyed. Why? Well, it so happened that you know, Chicago is on Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan is enormous and they have beaches that are like ocean beaches. Of course, they're segregated. And the idea was that not just the physical land of the beach was segregated, but, you know, the water was segregated, too. And a black boy had been out on the black beach and out on the water and drifted over, unbeknownst to him, into the white section. And people started throwing rocks at him, harassing him, and he drowned. He died. And black people obviously were horrified and enraged by that. And they were even more enraged when the white authorities of the city didn't, didn't do anything about it. Those people didn't get punished. And they lashed out. And I think white people were surprised by that. And they, they discovered that a lot of, especially those black veterans who had fought against the Germans in the Great War, sure as shit weren't going to come back to America and stand for things like this. And of course, at the same time in the South, there was a renewal of, or a sort of, reorganization of the Ku Klux Klan. It is reformed. The, the old version, remember as the Lost Cause tells it, when the law and order had come back, which means when they had succeeded in creating a society of white supremacy, there was no need for the Klan anymore, and it kind of died off. Well, there's a resurgence here, and I mean here. I mean at Stone Mountain in Georgia. There is a meeting convened on the top of that mountain there's a reason why they committed during that time, and this is decades after the Civil War. There's a reason why even decades after this, almost in my own lifetime, not quite, I am 40 now, but I'm not quite this old, where they committed to finishing work that had begun during this time that we're looking at here to put up that bas-relief um, engraving of the Confederate generals on that mountain. It becomes a physical sort of um, monument to the lost cause. And they very much were recognizing the role that the mountain played in the return of the Ku Klux Klan during this period right here. So in, later in the 70s, when that work is completed, they were very much aware that, and were commemorating that that is where this happened. There's no mistake in that connection. 
Inspired also, by the way, of the film Birth of a Nation that I talked about that reminded people of the supposedly glorious activities of the original clan. Inspired by well, what would have been the lynching of a black man and turned out to be the lynching of a Jewish man in Marietta uh, around that time for supposedly raping a white woman. man named Leo Frank. Questions about anything? Alright. So. The term, the idea of a new Negro, that those words were coined by Booker T. Washington, but they're adopted by black people, especially in cities in the North in the 1920s, who actually rejected a lot of Booker T. Washington's accommodationist message. To them, this concept of the new Negro was to, or included, I should say, a demand for social and political equality and a rejection of the idea of assimilation. Those who supported the idea in the 20s of the New Negro would urge taking pride in your African heritage, creating, instead of feeling you had to adopt or adapt to white American culture, creating instead a distinct African American culture. The people who were the, the fathers and mothers of, the jazz, of jazz and blues and gospel, that is exactly what they were doing. And this ideology takes hold organizationally as well, and organizations like, of course, the NAACP, but also the Urban League. Urban League was headquartered also in New York City, but like the NAACP, had offices all over the country that would organize, especially in those days, boycotts of businesses, white businesses that refused to hire black people, and it would pressure those businesses in the cities in which they were located to not only hire black folks, but to address issues of better housing and sanitation in black neighborhoods. The director of research and editor of the Journal of the Urban League was Charles Johnson. So he's sort of the equivalent to Du Bois, but in the Urban League. That journal that they published, an academic journal, in fact, was Opportunity, Journal of Negro Life. It featured sociological research, but also published essays and poems from black writers. It's no accident that they published a lot of sociology, by the way. Johnson was a sociologist by trade who graduated from the University of Chicago one of the top public institutions in America. He had witnessed that race riot that we were talking about earlier in Chicago. And he wanted to explain how or why that could happen. He wanted to explain it by illuminating the environmental factors, the structural factors that had led Chicago to that point of racial violence. And he published a book, The Negro in Chicago, which laid out from a sociologist, academic, scientific perspective how something like that could happen. That becomes the Negro in Chicago, the key text of the Chicago School of Sociology. When I say school here, this doesn't mean like school like we were at Georgia State or he was at University of Chicago, that's the school. It means like a school of thought, like a group of academic individuals who have a particular way of approaching something. It becomes, again, a model then that book does for how other people could use a sociological approach to explain why things are the way they are in fill in the blank city or not even in the city. You could take that approach and look at say the rural south and explain the structural and environmental factors that were in play. Du Bois published a similar study, The Philadelphia Negro, which was partly a model for Johnson, as was Ida Wells' Red Record. You think about the way she sort of scientifically approached 
exposing what lynching really was as opposed to what white people tried to claim that it was and to prove that with research and facts and notation. So Johnson had some things to build on there. In any case, he moves to Harlem. That's when he joined the Urban League in the 1920s, but he eventually moves back south. He'd been born in Virginia, so moves to Harlem, joins the Urban League, becomes active. Of course, he'd been in Chicago for a while. But point being, he eventually comes back south. He joins the faculty at Fisk in Nashville. He becomes the chair of the social sciences there at Fisk, training a whole generation of sociologists who would systematically study black life in the South, and himself included. He publishes more works, so you don't have to know the titles, but Shadow of the Plantation, Growing Up in the Black Belt, using that same methodology from the Negro in Chicago, but applying that to black life in the South. He eventually becomes the first black president of Fisk University in the 1940s. and was instrumental in bringing to Fisk, to the faculty there, James Weldon Johnson, who we'll talk about. For the NAACP was increasing its membership at the time too. In the 1920s, uh, membership in the NAACP tops 100,000. There are 300 plus chapters of the organization across the United States. And James Weldon Johnson becomes the first black executive secretary of that institution and increases its membership significantly through a $1 a year membership drive. This is the period of time which the organization becomes majority black. Remember, it had been biracial to begin with. It actually was majority white in its earliest years. And it does remain committed to interracial cooperation. Johnson himself, in this case, James Weldon Johnson, not Charles Johnson, was a poet and a musician who moved to New York City from Florida as part of the Great Migration, becomes part of the Harlem Renaissance. He writes the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which becomes the national Negro anthem as dubbed by the NAACP. He actually attended Atlanta University in the 1890s served in the foreign service as a U.S. consul to the nations of Venezuela and Nicaragua in the Teddy Roosevelt administration. He compiled and published a book of old Negro spirituals. So is a, a guy who's interested in the culture of the slave South, but also writes a book called Black Manhattan about Harlem. And as I mentioned, he is recruited to fist by Charles Johnson and becomes the chair of creative writing and literature there, eventually. Under his leadership, there are some ups and downs for the NAACP. In terms of success, uh, the Supreme Court in Buchanan versus Worley strikes down state and municipal laws mandating residential segregation. Though, as we've discussed, residential segregation didn't necessarily need laws on the books. It could be created, enforced, maintained in so many other ways. But a win is a win. They supported the so-called dire anti-lynching bill, which would have made lynching a federal crime because, of course, white people could get away with lynching. Uh, state and local governments with white juries would not hold them accountable for that. But if you made it a federal crime, like they did with the Force Acts and the Klan during Reconstruction, maybe you could hold people accountable. Uh, but thanks to white Southern opposition, the bill fails, never passes, despite repeated attempts. Likewise, the NAACP attempts to um, act as criminal defense when they know that uh, accused black defendants have been accused wrongly or be wrongly prosecuted as the famous case of the so-called Scottsboro Boys in 1920s Alabama, where a group of young men are on a train 
who hopped on that train hoboing, so to speak, from Chattanooga into North Alabama, when they get in a fight with a group of white guys, beat them up, and then get accused by two white girls who were with them of raping them, which they didn't do, it's all a lie, as one of the women would admit later. And they're all sentenced to death by a jury, all white jury, of course, had no, no representation, no lawyers, no nothing. And then when they did, it was, you know, less than a half-assed job. Uh, the NAACP sent people down, lawyers down, to try to defend these young men uh, and worked with them for a while, but eventually lost out to uh, actually the Communist Party of the United States. Uh, ends up representing those young men. Eventually, after their lives had been totally ruined and years in jail, they were all exonerated. And some of the decisions of the Supreme Court to come out of that, like for example, the court says if you're charged with murder, uh, you get a, a lawyer, <laughs> even if you can't afford one, which of course we would later expand, and now if you're charged with any significant crime, you should have access to some kind of representation. So there are some things that come out of that, my point here being it's a, it's a loss for the NAACP because they got sort of muscled out by the Communist Party, but um, I digress. Carter Woodson, another history PhD from Harvard, who like Charles Johnson and James Weldon Johnson becomes a leading black intellectual during this time. He established an organization known as the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915 and founded the academic journal, the Journal of Negro History, which is still published by the University of Chicago Press. He also published the Negro History Bulletin, making black history available to educators, students, the general public. He eventually joined the faculty at Howard University, the HBCU in Washington, DC. He becomes a dean at Howard. And he established the idea of Negro History Week to be celebrated in the month of February to coincide with the birthdays of both Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Negro History Week he envisioned being something that schools and organizations could commemorate for one week each February. And of course eventually in the 1970s this becomes Black History Month which we are, in fact, in the midst of celebrating right now. So he is regarded Carter Woodson as the father of Negro history. And Marcus Garvey. A man in terms of building a following who would have dwarfed the influence of all those three individuals. But uh, you might say it was a quirky individual too. Du Bois thought he was a lunatic. <laughs> and called him dangerous. <laughs> but certainly he spoke to a lot of people. And I mean, he spoke to their, their hearts and minds. He eventually founds an organization known as UNIA, or the United Negro Improvement Association that would come to have literally millions of followers. I mean, I'm throwing the numbers out for Urban League and NAACP in terms of tens or hundreds of thousands. And UNIA becomes an organization of millions with chapters, not just in America, but in the Caribbean too. For Marcus Garvey is from Jamaica. He's not born in the United States, but that is where he eventually ended up. He was born in very, very poor rural Jamaica and ends up moving to um, Kingston, capital city of Jamaica, spending time there in the black slums of Trenchtown, spending time throughout the Caribbean and Latin America where he's exposed to the horrible conditions that many peasants live and essentially plant white-owned plantations and the like that they have to endure, cultivating sugarcane and eventually bananas and coffee and the like. And he becomes a labor leader and a journalist advocate for the rights of poor laborers. He spends some time actually in London, in England, where he is influenced by the movement for anti-colonialism 
at a time where nations like Britain and France and others had colonized essentially the entire African continent, besides Ethiopia, basically, and were exploiting those areas for their own economic benefit. And so he becomes an advocate for what we might call African nationalism, that is the independence of those colonies, uh, those places that have been colonized by European nations in Africa. And so, of course, he is an advocate and someone who embraces pan-Africanism. Comes to believe that African peoples ought to have self-determination and work with people throughout the black diaspora, including black people in the Caribbean, Latin America, and America proper, to that end. He's influenced, of course, by Washington, but his message is a little bit different. I mean, racial pride, racial unity, yes, but separatism. An advocate of separatism as opposed to integration. A, a man who very controversially actually has some talks with leaders of the Ku Klux Klan. He becomes an early advocate of the idea, though, of the New Negro, arguing that black people ought to forget about white American culture, embrace their African heritage, build upon that, build separate black institutions, especially economic ones, not just culturally speaking. So he's an advocate for uh, black economic independence and black nationalism. He even condemned integration and argued against what white people called race mixing. I mentioned he's an advocate, of course, of pan-Africanism, the idea that all black people in the African diaspora should work together for their collective betterment. Black nationalism, the idea that there should be black nation states and perhaps even one great black nation state for, as Garvey put it, those at home and abroad. Supported black people in the Western Hemisphere and the New World joining the Back to Africa movement. I mentioned black economic nationalism, the idea that there needed to be more black businesses supports the creation of a Negro Factories Corporation, supports the publication of a Negro World newspaper, argues that in black communities there ought to be black hotels and restaurants and banks and so on. He was a sensational orator, by the way. He was a great speaker, very captivating. He had a sort of cadence to his speech that could really capture you in a sort of almost semi-religious way. He's almost, he is not a preacher, but he's able to speak with that same sort of authority. Though he does, in addition to that, as you can see, he kind of looks, he's got like the pseudo-preacher garb in the picture on the left, but he also liked to have the like mili overtly military garb there on the right and kind of structured Uniah almost as like a quasi-paramilitary force, which made him threatening to a lot of white people. And like I said, Du Bois called him dangerous and looked on him as kind of like a cult leader. And he in turn criticized Du Bois for being light-skinned and you know, born free in the North and you know, not connecting with the majority of black people and so on. He harbored, uh, did Garvey, uh, anti-Semitic, that is, anti-Jewish views. And ultimately, I mean, he moves to Harlem. I mentioned he comes to America. He moves to Harlem in the 19-teens and, of course, grows Uniah there and, and elsewhere. But it was while he was there that he starts this Black Star line that ultimately would be, I guess, a kind of stain of... Uh, further staying on his, his legacy uh, and actually would result in him going to prison, perhaps un, un, unfairly, un, un, unjustly so. He starts this Black Star Lines, a steamship company that aimed to connect black people in the Americas with Africa. And he sold stock in the company at $5 a share, but they apparently uncovered some sort of financial wrongdoing and he gets convicted of mail fraud, even though I think it was relatively clear uh, 
uh, in retrospect, that he was not directly responsible for the wrongdoing that had occurred, but he is this militant, threatening figure, and so why authorities are able to use that to throw him in federal prison for two years in actually Atlanta. And he is ultimately deported after his release, kicked out of the United States. But he continued his activism from Jamaica and London until he died in the 1940s, and regardless of whatever stains or sort of asterisks or caveats you have to put by his name, he was tremendously influential. I mean, the list of, of ideologies and individuals that Marcus Garvey influenced is long and distinguished. Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Black Power, in the 1960s and 70s. Rastafarianism, Bob Marley, another Jamaican. The Nation of Islam, uh, Elijah Muhammad, Louis Farrakhan, I mentioned Malcolm X. I mean, all of these individuals and institutions you know, owe a debt, an intellectual debt to and maybe an organizational debt to Marcus Garvey. And finally, and I know we have, what, four minutes left? But I guess just then really briefly, by the 20s, Harlem had of course become a cultural mecca for black America. The heart of a new Negro arts movement Poets, novelists, visual artists, dancers and choreographers, musicians, of course. Similar to Garvey and Unaya, they embraced their African heritage and sought to create a truly African-American culture to, quote, affirm the value of blackness and to, quote, present authentic versions of the African-American experience. That being said, they were not all of them necessarily separatists like Garvey. They found receptive publishers in Crisis, the NAACP publication, Opportunity, the Urban League publication, A. Philip Randolph's The Messenger publication that we've talked about, all published essays, poems, art produced by Harlem Renaissance artists. especially like that published by Zora Neale Hurston, born in Notasoga, Alabama, raised in Eatonville, Florida, North Florida, but who eventually goes to study literature and philosophy under Alan Locke at Howard. Alan Locke we talked about at the very beginning of the semester. He encourages Hurston and others to move to Harlem. This is where it's at. This is where it's all happening in the north of Manhattan in New York City. Hurston published an anthology of essays and poetry and art in 1921 entitled The New Negro. She published short stories about contemporary black life, including in the literary magazine Fire, which she co-founded with the poet and essayist Langston Hughes arguably the two great figures of the Harlem Renaissance from a literary perspective are Hurston and Hughes. And Fire, they published essays on what would be considered, I mean, perhaps now, or probably not, but certainly back then sort of edgy subjects like homosexuality and bisexuality and interracial relationships and prostitution and what they call color prejudice, like where you have Garvey criticizing Du Bois because he's light-skinned. Now, if we go, weren't out of time, I'll read you some Langston Hughes poetry. You can follow the link there yourself and check it out if you haven't already. The cover design of Fire was um, the work of Aaron Douglas, who I mentioned in the beginning. That is some Aaron Douglas visual art beneath the photo of Zora Neale Hurston there. He's the great visual artist of the movement, uh, responsible especially for a number of murals in the sort of post-industrial American Gothic style. He becomes the head of the art department at Fisk, 
It's amazing how Fisk and Howard and these institutions, these HBCUs, are, are these meccas for these great intellectuals and academics. Hurston's masterwork, by the way, if any of you had to read or read for pleasure, Their Eyes Were Watching God, nobody? Well, check it out. It's an incredible novel, one of the greatest American novels, arguably, of the 20th century. It tells the story of a woman and her path to independence and her quest for some kind of meaningful love and her dealings with a series of flawed black men uh, forced to endure the double oppression of both race and womanhood and culminating in a great, actually, uh, historical hurricane that occurred in, in Florida in the 1920s. Finally, um, Harlem nightlife, jazz and blues clubs everywhere, catering some of them to segregated all white audiences, some of them all black, some of them integrated, all of them selling illegal alcohol during the era of prohibition. Places like the Cotton Club, the Apollo, the Lincoln Theater, the Lafayette Theater, innumerable little holes in the wall. But at the big ones like Cotton Club, you had guys like Louis Armstrong come to play from New Orleans, bringing jazz to New York City. Blues singers, like I mentioned, Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith bringing the blues to New York City. And then uh, composers and pianists that become the leaders of the big band movement like Duke Ellington. Big band is a form of jazz which, well, featured big ass bands uh, that were performed in these clubs, typically with a charismatic uh, pianist, composer, singer, band leader like Ellington becomes the quintessential one. And all of these individuals make records, and those records are played on the radio all throughout America, and jazz becomes all the rage in America during that period, such that some will even look back and call it the jazz age and consider this. In a period in which you have, throughout the country, white supremacy, discrimination, etc., and second-class citizenship for African Americans, they create something that becomes the sort of quintessential American art form, which is incredible, and should be one of the takeaways from our looking at this period. I've kept you far too long, and so that'll be that.